Oh, hello. Many Magic the Gathering players ask the question, how do I just keep it casual in Commander? Well, I've invited here today my good friend and member of the Commander Advisory Group, Shivam Bhatt, to talk with us about how to keep it casual in Commander. Shivam, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Professor. It's wonderful to visit your campus. It's wonderful to have you here. I want to start before we get into keeping it casual in Commander by defining that term. Casual. Uh, we have casual commander and we do have competitive commander. And just in terms of definition, in your own words, what do you consider casual commander to be or to mean? And what do you consider competitive commander to, to be well, or mean? To start with, I can tell you right now that casual commander is not the pejorative that people would like to use. It doesn't mean simple magic for babies. Let's start by defining competitive commander first. Okay. Because with competitive commander, then you can extrapolate out to casual. So what competitive commander to me means is taking the card pool of 24,000 cards that we have in EDH and finding the cards that are the most powerful, that skim the top edge of the entire card pool, optimizing them into a way that will effectively and quickly win a game, either through combo or through um, some kind of just very fast and effective way to win. Like a classic would be... Uh, Painter, Servant, and Grindstone, for instance, and being able to grind out a game and win as quickly as you can. Mm -hmm. The object of a competitive commander game is to prove your skill at Magic, to show how good you are at finding the best cards out of this pool and getting the most possible value and strength out of them, and then exerting your dominance over the rest of the table. Now, in contrast to that, casual commander is, well, the entire rest of the format, right? It's taking your favorite cards, putting them into a pile with your favorite commanders to choose from, finding a way to play that's like tribal-based or... Uh, actually, it's not even fair to say tribal-based or anything. It's just casual commander is how you play commander. It's just, we're getting together. I've got 99 cards as a general. Any number of themes or any number of things. The key here, though, is that we're not playing for prizes. We're not playing for rankings. We're just playing to have a good time. Right. And we're playing with our friends either at uh, GP, uh, Magic Fest, your home, your office, your library, your workplace, whatever, uh, your local game store. But the entire point of the game is to find a way to hang out with your friends and play Magic that is not, doesn't have the pressure of competition associated with it. I see. Okay, but don't commander players, casual commander players play to win? I mean, I don't play competitive EDH, but when I sit down to play commander, I play to win. Right. I want to win. The point is, obviously, you want to win the game. We're playing a game to win. Right. right. We, I've got 40 life. You've got 40 life. I want you to get to zero before I do. But that's not the motivation. Like, the driving motivation of a competitive deck is, I built this deck to win. Mm -hmm. I came here tonight so that I can crush you into the ground. Not, And I don't mean like I'm not trying to obliterate you, but I'm just saying like I want to win. I right. really want to win. When I'm playing in a non-competitive commander, it's more like, okay, well, I want to win. I'm going to try to win, but I also want to hang out with you. Right. And I want to chill and I want to be hanging out with my friends. And our motivation is less about winning. I mean, let's be real. Winning is the point, right? Like when me and Olivia and the professor sit down to play, one of us is going to win and I'm going to try to crush them because they're my friends and I want to crush them. But if I lose, whatever, we just hung out and I feel like the two hours or whatever that I spent with you playing my game was a valuable use of my time. Sure. So the social aspect, the social aspect is really you. vital to it as well. It's let's sit down, let's hang out. I have a pile of cards that I like. You have a pile of cards that you like. Let's see what they do. And as we see what we do, we are trying to win within that capacity, but we didn't necessarily assemble them with maximum optimization yeah. in mind. Thank you. I mean, because, for instance, you'll have infinite combos in your commander decks. You're going to have brutally huge creatures, Voltron decks, unblockability. But that's just incidental. That's cards that you're playing that you find interesting and fun. Yeah, you'll win, but your motivation isn't to try to get the best possible way to win like in a competitive space you might be playing with cards that you don't necessarily like but are the best iteration of that card right right like 
if there's a one mana effect that does this and a five mana effect that does this, you might not take the five mana effect, even though it's also got some other fun and cool things or a cool piece of art or whatever. You're going to take the one that's always going to be better. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be in your competitive deck. Or you're going to pick your commander to maximize the ability for you to win in the most effective way possible or to give you the widest color spread to be able to do what you want to do. Whereas if you're playing a non-competitive commander, you might be picking your commander because you like their artwork or because you want to build around the theme that's based on that card. You might be picking cards that are suboptimal because they're emotionally resonant to you in some way, right? Like in my Titania deck, I pick, uh, the, I've got like 12 different rampant growth type effects. Some of them are just terrible objectively, but I pick them because they remind me of when I was in sixth grade playing Magic or they remind me of like, oh, I like this art and I got this card from this person and I traded that person. for You know, they give they tell me a different story than the cards on the table. And that's okay because I'm not trying to get the most optimal way to win. Mm -hmm. uh, in in my uh, mono red Felden deck, I have one copy of Shivan Dragon. Yeah. Uh, Shivan, not Shivam. Uh, uh, <laughs> Dragon, uh, simply because that was my favorite card in high school. And right. it's not a bad card. Uh, it's and a great it's card. fine. I actually, it's really, and it's fun. And when I hit that card on the battlefield, it gets a reaction from everyone sitting at the table, especially since I'm using Revised uh, uh, with the Melissa Benson art and, and mm -hmm. it's very nostalgic. And there's a better, more optimal card that I could put in that of slot. Course. But the deck is still strong, and I still play to win when I play with Felden. I've been building a, a green-blue sea monsters deck with Kiora for a very long time, and I've got Mahamori Jin in there. Mm -hmm. Mahamori Jin is a 5-6 flyer that does literally nothing else but <laughs> sit and be very expensive and fly. And it's in my deck because I love that card. Exactly. Yeah, it could be any number of much better 5-6 flyers that do infinitely better things than just sit there and fly. But this is my card. And yet, despite all this, is it fair for me to say that casual commander is inherently at its base, if its very foundation, broken, hopelessly, hopelessly a broken, broken format? 100%. Why? Why is that fair <laughs> commander, to say? Casual commander, all commander, is fundamentally from the core a broken game of magic. Because you can, you've got such a small band list with such a wide card pool that all of the things you can do in other forms of magic that are just absurdly busted are legal because singleton format of commander makes it fair and not fair. I don't mean fair as in like, Oh, of course this is balanced magic, but it means that you have just as much chance of finding your utterly broken and completely jank combo as anybody else does. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the lack of consistency is what helps commander be a broken format without being a, like, just, you know, hideously broken format. Right. I mean, we've got the ability to do, you can do things that are just, I can, like, my Brea deck, every time I play it, I find an infinite combo that I did not deliberately put in there. Just accidentally. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, oh, if I put these two cards that I totally forgot were in the deck together, then I, I mean... I can go infinite with Eldrazi Displacer and Brea and Ashna Altar and doing all these things and bouncing up and down and just, oh, did I just win accidentally because I forgot that I had Zulaport Cutthroat in play and it just did 12 billion damage to everybody? Commander is broken on purpose. Commander is broken because it's the format where we can sit and play the most fun, ridiculous things you can do in Magic. But because we're playing with the social contract, with the idea of we're trying to have fun, it's okay. Like... If it was trying to play for rankings or prizes or competition, we would have to ban so many cards to make it fair. Not even fair. It's not possible. It's not possible to make Commander into a fair format and keep it Commander. If it is not possible to make Commander into a fair format and keep it Commander, and the social contract is the only thing, and by social contract, uh, 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 you mean just the fact that we agree not to just exploit all these broken aspects of it in the most optimal way possible so that we can actually get a game in, uh, then why do we need a ban list at all? And you are, and I ask that specifically of you because you are uh, on the uh, advisory group, sure. the CAG, yeah. as they call it, the Commander Advisory Group. And so you don't make decisions in any way on, no. on, on bans, but you do offer I, advice I, and counsel to the people who do, right? Absolutely. Okay. So the CAG- so Why do we need bans? Why, why not just social contract is, like, again, why do, why do you need to, I'll take a specific example. Why do you need to ban my precious Leovold? He is inherently broken, inherently evil, one of the most despicable 
despicable, very unfortunate commanders. But what if I just said, okay, fine, social contract, I'm just going to build him with a, a, a light elf's uh, you know, tribal theme and not the the Teferi puzzle box lock. Uh, no one's going to play with me with it. Like, why do I, why do you need to actually have a ban on Teferi and these other cards? Leovold. Um, so here's the th oh god, I hate Leovold so much. But okay, so let's let's pull. I back do too, but I look like him when my hair is long, <laughs> so. so let's pull back a step and let me answer your question yeah. broadly. First okay. off, the bot we have this thing called the Commander Philosophy document that we came up with last year, which kind of sets out what the the idea of commander is what what it means when you sit down and play commander what are we agreeing to do mm -hmm. right and the bottom line of this says commander is a broken format it's more fun if you don't break it right like we fundamentally believe that you can do the most absurd obscene things in commander we just think you would be having a better time if you maybe didn't right mm -hmm. so why do we need a band list because we have rule zero rule zero says when before we sit down to play you and i'll sit and have a discussion and say like Okay, well, I'm playing my Attracts of Planeswalkers deck, and you're going to be playing your, like, mono chair tribal or ladies turning left deck or whatever. Maybe we should find a better deck to have a better play experience with each other because my deck is going to blow yours out of the water, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, we can have this um, conversation beforehand, the rule zero discussion, where we sit there and say, look, we have an imbalance in decks. Let's find better decks to play with each other. But the reason we have a band list is because some cards are just stronger than a discussion. Mm -hmm. Some cards are just so fundamentally against the core of the format that they represent either being too strong or just change gameplay to be something that we don't want it to be. So um, I'll use your Leovold example. for. Uh, so one of the things is when Leovold came out, Leovold is the card that says um, that when you draw when your opponents draw the cards past their first one, they don't draw it, right? And when Leovold is targeted, the control of Leovold draws a card. And so what you would do is you would play Leovold and then you play like a time twister style thing. Right. Force you to discard your cards. You get seven new cards. The other players get none. And then you would have to ferry to Puzzle Box, which is a card that replaces your first draw. And the net result is that the other players get locked out of the game. And... What the way we look at it with all these, there's a whole category of these cards, which are like, like Iona, for instance, or Leovold or stuff like that, which are basically that say that player doesn't get to play magic. Mm -hmm. And that to me personally, and to kind of the rules committee in general, is counter to the idea of Commander. Commander is a social format. We're getting together. We're setting time aside to come and hang out and play cards. The cards are just kind of the facilitating us being able to play. And these cards basically sit there and say, like, you don't get to play. So you've spent your time and lost it. You've basically blocked off this two hours or whatever of your busy schedule to sit and play commander with your friends. And you're just sitting there watching your other friend play, shuffle through their cards and play their decks while you do literally nothing. That's, Sounds like a lot of the games of Commander I play <laughs> with people following the ban list. Because that's, that's just like, that feels to me like... Stacks decks, pillow fort decks. You know, that's... There's so much. Like, like you sh you can't ban an, enough cards to fix Commander. It's inherently broken. No, but there are some individual cards. Indivi yeah. So that's the thing. Like, I'm not going to sit there and advocate that we ban all the stacks cards. We can't ban smoke stacks and winter orbs and torpor orb and all of these things that make your things miserable to play we can't right. ban pillow forts but by taking out leovold which is a repeatable effect because it's your commander or iona because it's your commander all these things by taking them out what you're doing is you're saying like we don't want this type of play to be represented in the format so use this kind of as an example i mean the rc wanted cards to represent an example of what you shouldn't be doing, mm -hmm. but that doesn't really work out. So there's some cards that are, so let me use a different example. Primeval Titan. Okay. Primeval Titan is one of my favorite cards. It's one of the cards that I played commander for when it started. And I was so bad, so, so mad when they banned Primeval Titan because it's one of the greatest cards in magic. Why wouldn't you want to ramp all the time? Well, it turns out when you're playing Primeval Titan, the entire game becomes about Primeval Titan. You put it out, you get your two lands and then the next player is trying to control magic that or clone it or write a replication or do something. The entire game basically becomes hot potato with the primeval Titan. You're either playing primeval Titan or you're playing a way to take it. And when the entire game becomes a focus of that, that's against the idea of diversity in the decks. So we have it banned, right? Like 
if you go through each card on the list, half of them, I think, I mean, there's some portion of them we could get rid of off the banned list. And that's a d- topic for a different day. Sure. But in general, when they were banned, they were banned because they were warping the gameplay in such a way that either made the entire game about them or introduced a format of playing the game mm. that was counter to the idea of us sitting down and having a good time. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that you can't be a griefer because God knows there's a lot of ways to be a griefer in Commander. Yes, there's that's a whole sub-movement. I mean, look, that's fine. If you want to play that and everybody's okay with it, knock yourself out. The second part is the key there, that everyone's okay with it. I think that... Because if you play griefer with me without me being okay with it, it's the last time you'll play with me. Right, that's exactly it. Like, I think those are the two things that uh, keep Commander... Commander is one is we have a discussion and sit there and say like, yo, you know what? I, I really don't want to be playing against Winter Orb because that's not the game I'm looking for. I want to actually try to play. My deck's not built to fight against it. I'm just going to get checked out. Mm-hmm. And two is, okay, you know what? You played this deck against me. I'm just going to choose not to play with you again. Right. And I don't like that, but it's also that's nobody's keeping you at the table in Commander. Right? True, true. Uh, you mentioned that's how you keep it Commander. My next question is how do we keep it casual? So without, and I'm going to put a restriction on you because we already did a full episode on uh, uh, how to evaluate your Commander deck's power level. Sure. And then when I spoke with Emma about common mistakes, power level came up again. I feel we've covered power level. Uh, besides power level, besides evaluating your deck's power level, which has been talked about, how do we keep Commander casual for those who are not interested in competitive EDH and we want to keep Commander casual, how do we keep Commander casual? Going back to what we talk about with casual, what does casual mean, right? Casual, the idea is we're coming out, we're playing a game of magic. We're hanging out, we're just chilling, we're having a good time. What does it mean to have a good time? That is a really objective, I mean, that's a really subjective idea, right? Like, yeah, my good time and the good time of somebody who enjoys a good stacks deck is not the same, right? Right. Like somebody might be like, I love the puzzle of breaking stacks open, sure. of sitting there and trying to figure out how do I get past all these taxing effects and actually win the game. That's cool. I get it. But also, like, I just want to play my tribal soldiers deck and you want to play your tribal hydras deck. And then our friend comes over here with like an Alora lockdown deck and it's like, okay, well, we're not on the same page, right? Mm-hmm. So keeping it casual to me means coming in with a mindset that we want to make sure that everybody leaves the table feeling like they had a good time. There's ways to do, to play magic so that everybody is super stoked by what you just did, right? Like when, when I talk about casual magic, I talk about when we play and you do something amazing, I want to be excited about it. I want to be so stoked that you got your deck to do this weird, obscure 12 card combo or that you got this two card combo to go off and it went infinite and you obliterated the whole table, even though you were in the face. I mean, I don't want to sit here with Torment of Hailfire t- sitting there telling me like, do you discard the cards or do you take three damage or do you sacrifice a creature? I mean, I now, hate that card in general, personally. Now do it but 48 more times. Yeah. And I'm like, uh, the, you know, why I hate that card and why I think that card's not a casual card. Because it, some people are like, well, just scoop, you lose. But because it gives you a choice, your mind always wants to find the way out right. to try to make, and then you extend it and stretch it. And it's just like, oh, you're not going to win, dude. That's exactly the type of cards that I hate in general in Magic, yeah. not just Commander, but they're they're basically I win cards that don't say I win. No. And and it's just, might as well just say I win. Yeah. You know, that's why I don't get excited over Emrakul and stuff like that. It's just like, great, cool. Uh, so next game, except now maybe I'm going to be foolish enough to keep playing. But that's a, that's a, that's another discussion. That's another discussion. Well, yeah. So in yeah. my opinion, when you're making a casual deck or you're aiming for a casual mindset, maybe leave the Torment of Hailfire to the side, right? Like maybe that's not the car. Like what mood do you want people to leave the table with? What about combo wins like my, my Tesa Darkest Hour? Uh, combo uh, decks are cool. Yeah. Like, I gotta I, assemble the pieces, but I can get that together. Or, or in even in Sig, I've got a combo win with Wander Wine Profits. Like, I mean, I'm not against combos. I think yeah. combos are great, but it's just about like okay. So think about this: Why do you think Commander doesn't like turn four combos or turn earlier than four combos or turn six combos? Because people want to play. Exactly. Because here's the thing: Commander is by nature a like. You don't get started until about turn six, turn seven. That's when you, after you've built up your kind of base, put out your mono rocks, kind of set up your establishment, and then the game starts rolling. Mm-hmm. And 
there's this notion of phases of commander. There's a build-up phase, then like there's blocks of turn one to three where you just you're playing your mono rocks, there's nothing going on. Turns four to six. Okay, you're playing some incidental things. Maybe we're having some interaction here and there. Turn seven through nine. Okay, now your combo can go off. Now maybe you've got your setup. Now maybe you can actually start alpha striking. And then from turns like 10 through 13, 10 to 12, okay, now the big finishers are coming down and your crater hoofs are coming out. Your big mega combo wins are coming. Because enough time has passed, people have been able to build up and play the game. Mm -hmm. If you end the game at turn four, think about it. I shuffled up my deck and the commander deck, 100 cards, it's forever to shuffle. Right. And then I sat down, I played, we did mulligans, we went through half an hour, I finally got my hand that I can play with. I put out a card, I put out like, you know, Island, Soul Ring, go. And you're like, Island, blah, 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 blah. Okay, well, I've got like 12 Monorock stuff. And you're like, okay, well, I put out Coiling Oracle. And then you're like, I combo off and win. By the time, like, you haven't gotten fulfillment. You have you spent all that time setting up your game and you haven't gotten to play. Mm -hmm. And so winning on like turn four earlier is to me contra to the idea of casual magic because both sides haven't had a chance to build up their tables to actually get to experience their decks. I mean, it sucks when you get mono screwed. It sucks when you get mono flooded. It sucks when you stuck with a handful of cards and you don't get to do anything, right? Like that to me is miserable. That's not how I want to, that's not what I intended when I sat down to play for an afternoon magic cards, right? Like I want to sit there. I mean, I don't necessarily need to win, but I want to play. I want to do things. I want to feel like I had a meaningful impact on the game. And because when I play magic, my goal is to make sure that the people I play against don't feel like they wasted their afternoon. Hmm. Like I want you to get up from a game, whether you won or lost and feel like, Oh man, some cool things happened. Oh man, I got to do thing with my deck. Oh man, I got to like, combo off, but then they stop me with a fluster storm. Oh no. You know, I want to be able to tell those stories, but if you win before I can even get started, or your deck's whole point is to stop me from getting started. What did I come here for? I could have been watching a movie if I didn't want to interact with anything, right? That's a very good point. It, it makes me wonder, and I'm curious your thoughts on this. Uh, do you think that perhaps tutor effects should not be legal in Commander at all because their only purpose is to increase consistency. You yourself said that part of the defining aspect of commanders, you get 99 cards, you don't know what's going to happen. But when I start putting in 10 tutors, uh, I am going to increase I, consistency. And yes, my taste of combo deck is chopped full of tutors because I need to grab an enchantment. I need to grab an artifact and, and, and make this combo happen. Why are tutors allowed in commander? So there's two levels to this question, yes. and that's a super fair question. It's a super important question, too. Because, again, for me, the core of Commander is that when you shuffle up your 99 cards, when you play, they're going to be a different set of 99 than the different set of 7 than they were the last time you played. And it's going to be super weird, super random. Things are going to happen. But some people like consistency in their decks, right? Sure. And you want maybe part of the doing the thing of your deck is getting those combo pieces and be able to do the thing. But... There's two parts to why don't we ban tutors. One is they are fun. It's fun to get your favorite. Like in my Tuvasa deck, I've got Elad, Eladamari's Call. Mm -hmm. The two mana that gets a creature and puts it into your hand or whatever. Because I want to pull Rafik out so that I can load him up with enchantments, go to Aura Town and crush people, right? But why can't we ban tutors? Well, what's a tutor, right? Demonic tutor, enlightened sure. tutor, worldly sure. tutor, in rampant growth a tutor. In a sense, it is. I it's, mean, like, search, search the idea would be a, a, a universal commander rule saying uh, any effects that have you search your library to get a card. Are fetch lands a tutor? Yes, in a sense. Is Heliod's Pilgrim a tutor? Yeah. In a like, sense. Well, actually, yes, Heliod's Pilgrim is, is very yeah. clearly a tutor. The only thing where people don't think about tutors, I find, in conversations is we tend not to, people don't realize things like fetch lands or even evolving wilds is essential. Well, people don't even realize evolving wilds is a fetch land. That's another story. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, also, yeah, you, you cultivate as a tutor in a sense. Uh, uh, well, not in a sense, it is. It is. It, I, I would say actually, yes, N no search effects. I would be very interested to see what that would be like. You, you, any There's, effects that would have you search your library for a card, you, you cannot do. There are over 200 cards that would just immediately, and they're like fundamental staples of Commander that right. would just be like sliced right out. Oh, yes. There are commanders that wouldn't be playable anymore. 
because they, you come into play and you get to tutor for right. a thing. And it's just untenable. Right. It would just like destabilize and destroy commander. Which is why your point of it's too broken to be banned into being into it to work. And and you know what? Even if you did this in the the whole rules rules committee lost their minds and, and declared this the next day. Can you imagine? <laughs> there would still be another problem and another problem and another well, problem because again Ca commander and casual commander, well, actually, just commander. It's it's fundamentally broken, and I feel that players need to acknowledge this when they sit down to play, and they need to say, "I am sitting down to play a broken format." So, if I can build off of that, yeah, please. So, one of the things is is that a lot of these decisions are made during deck construction, mm -hmm. right? Like when you have your ninety nine, or you got your commander, and you're building your deck you are making choices of the kind of game you're going to play by the cards you put into your deck, right? Like when you're building your deck, you are deciding, am I going to be the person who's winning on turn four? Or am I going to be the one who's helping you do the cool thing with your deck? You know, it's like, what is my goal here? When I put torment of hailfire into my deck, that's making a statement. <laughs> I have, I have made a choice or when I put flash into my deck or when tangle I put tangle wire, when you tangle put wire, tangle wire in your or deck, you put winter orb, I, I feel like a, 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 a parent being like, you better have a very good explanation for why you did that, young kid. Like, you know, like, why, why did you put Tangle Wire in your deck? Why? Like, think about it. Every card you put in your deck is a card you intend to play. Right. And when you play it, ask yourself, why? What are you doing? What do you want to do with this? Why is this card in your deck? What is the mood and the feel and the vibe that you're going for with this card? And that will determine who you are and what you are taken as and what people think of you. Like, are you going to be a casual player? Then you're probably not putting in, like, your Leovold into your deck. Well, you or, can't anymore because it's banned. What's a banned list among casuals? Nah. Right? No, but, I mean, there's, like, cards that are just, like, why would you do that? Right. Why did you make that choice? You didn't need to put Torment to Hellfire. There's plenty of ways to win in black that don't need to be the tortured, strung out way. I think the strung out is the thing that gets me. I, I personally, to be honest. No, I don't mean to know. attack the folks no, who do no, like no, no, the no. hailfires. And they might have a fun, somebody's going to post in the comments, and I look forward to reading it. Somebody's going to say, well, if you do torment with this other card and this other card, you get this cool interaction and, and, and effect, and that's fine. I mean, and, and that's what Commander, originally Commander was just bored judges wanting to see what happened when you jammed <laughs> a bunch of cards that were never meant to interact with each exactly. other. And the amazing gameplay system of magic allows these cards to interact like it's it's like i want to see what happens when i plug my blender into my vcr into my <laughs> uh, uh uh in into my uh uh car and 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 that 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 imagine that those three completely different mechanisms would interact in this new unexpected way and that's exactly where commander originally just came from yep. and that in many ways is 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 what we need to focus on for a, a ca keeping it casual more so than just a, a strung out win. And I think it's important to let the listeners know we're not banning. Viewers, viewers, the, we have vision. I'm sorry. Viewers. I'm, I'm, a, I'm old a school podcast. podcaster. We'll get to, you have a podcast? We will get to plugging your podcast, Casual Magic with Stephen Bot in a minute. <laughs> but here's the thing. I'm not trying to tell people we're going to ban Torment Hellfire. It's not yes. going to happen. No. Uh, it, you don't not, have the power to do that. I don't have the you're power just, to do You're that. just an advisor. But also, also, it's just, it's not ban worthy. Yeah. It's just irritating, but it's not ban worthy. You, you just bring Sheldon his coffee, right? He's just <laughs> exactly. like, here's your coffee, sir. And by the way, maybe Torment of Hellfire. Get out. I didn't ask you. <laughs> you know what? That's kind of what the meetings go like. <laughs> I'm just saying, but, uh, <laughs> but the point though, is like when you make the, I guess if we go back all the way to the top of the show topic. Yes. What is casual magic? I think fundamentally casual magic is deck construction. Mm -hmm. Is the choices you make when you build your deck. Mm -hmm. It is choosing to pick the cards that are going to enhance the enjoyment and the experience of everybody playing the game without like, I mean, it's, you're trying to uplift the table. You're trying to give a positive expression. I'm not saying you're trying to lose. You could still try to win and win in a really cool and fun way. I'm just saying, and maybe not even really cool. I don't want to be forcing my opinion of casual magic on all the people. Some people just want to play the best cards and win sure. the best way. That's fine. That's yeah. great. But when you're constructing your deck and when you're picking the cards, the cards you pick are the sign that you're showing to other people. That is the face that you are presenting to the world when you sit down to a commander table. And you sit down and you flip over, uh, you know, the... Um, Sanguine bond, right? right. Like, 
And like you sit there and you're like, okay, well, I gain a life, you take a life, and well, now we know what the game is going to be. Right. Right? Like, or you put out Sulfuric Vortex. Okay, now we know what the game is going to be. Sure. Um, that's fine, but you're making a statement. And what is that statement? And what do you want the other players to take away from that? Interesting. I like that emphasis on on the casual commanders and the deck construction because a lot of times I've heard people complain a little bit about and say, well, look, we're magic players. We want to play to win. I said that to you at the top of the show. And I I do. So are we supposed to just go easy on people when we play commander to keep it casual? I think, no, you're not supposed to go easy. But when your deck construction, perhaps you're supposed to take a different tact. And then once you have taken that tact, you sit down with that deck and you play it for all it's worth, but it's what you are playing with. So let me, let me use an example based off of that. So there's a card called Aura Shards. Yes, it's I like know Aura Shards. Yeah. One green, white, right? Like it when you play a, a an enchantment or something, it breaks another permanent. Right. Like it can, and that card is a very hostile card. It like can destroy tables of like wrecking permanents left and right. But it's also like when I play, I like to play defensively. Basically, like I'm building my Voltron. I've got Aura Shards out because it gives me the extra cards out of my Tuvasa deck, and I play it, and then I can just zap things that are going to start destroying my enchantments. Right. But when you're playing against someone like I was playing against a friend of mine who was playing an all vehicles deck. Right. Vehicles is super weak to aura shards. And he was by you know, by right, very, very scared of this card. He didn't want to play his cards or his deck because anything I did would just start destroying his game plan until he could find a way to remove aura shards from the game and then he could start actually playing. And that's when I realized I'm like, oh, I'm sending the wrong message with this card. Like, I'm sending the message that when I play this card, I'm going to be a proactive, hostile, destroying your game plan type of player. That's not the type of person I am. I'm a, I want you to have fun. I want your deck to do the thing. I want to beat you, but I don't want to beat you by stopping you from playing. Hmm. Right? And so what I re- when I realized that, oh, I am stopping these people from playing because a card that I thought was just going to be a defensive, help them get out of a jam type of card ended up being a proactive and super dangerous card. So I took Aura Shards out of my deck because in deck construction, I have made that choice that I want to present a deck that says, if you let me do my thing, I'm going to do something cool and do it, but I'm not going to stop you from doing your thing. I'm not going to prevent you from playing the game because that doesn't advance my deck concept in any way. And it also makes the game more animosity, more hostile than the type of game I want to play. Similarly, when I built my Titania deck, Titania is all about throwing your lands at the graveyard to get five, three elementals, and then right. alpha striking. The thing that I realized I was when I was building the deck first, I was like, okay, what are the best ways for me to get my lands into the graveyard? And I found cards like Dust Bowl. Right. Dust Bowl says, you know, pay three, sacrifice it, sack one of your lands to destroy target land. I'm like, great, I can repeatedly put my lands into the graveyard. What I didn't realize, I'm like, oh, I'm also just like turbo land destruction. Like I had all the strip mines and wastelands and everything and crucible worlds. And I realized that my deck was basically just a Ponza deck that was just stopping everybody it was the most hateful like completely destructive deck ever Mm -hmm. and i took like half those cards out of the deck because i realized that whoa i want to be playing because i'm making big tokens and winning by doing cool dumb token things not by being like the complete lockdown you don't get to play magic guy and that realization helped me understand the difference between a casual mentality of playing so that everybody is having a good time Versus a cutthroat mentality of, I guess competitive is not the right word. Cutthroat is cutthroat. Kind of, yeah, yeah, like because like I feel you can once you sit down with the deck, you can be cutthroat. Yeah, it's just what is in the deck that you're cutting throats with. Right. This al- the algorithm has already screwed me. Makeup tutorial. Makeup tutorial. Ten tips to get better blush. Anyway, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, that it's like once you sit down. So you, you talked about taking lands out of that deck, but then once you had done that, you still sat down and played that deck to the best of your ability. Yeah, of course I did. Uh, you took out Aura Shards because that wasn't what you wanted to be doing, but once you took it out, you didn't sit down and say, well, I'm not going to cast it this turn because this is that's no. too mean. Like, it's in there. So uh, the gameplay is still magic gameplay. I mean, in many ways, I, I could go down to Friday Night Magic and say, oh, I don't have a deck on me for standard. I don't play standard at the moment. I really wanted to play tonight. And someone says, I got a spare deck. It, it's not it's not really that good, though, but I, you can get some games. And so I go, okay, cool. I take the deck and I sit down and I play it to the best of my ability. Of course. And you know what? I've had a few times where and then I, I bust 
busted through and I maybe didn't win the FNM, but I, I got in there. Of course. And and I was like, yeah, I made it work. I'm like, oh my God, they're running the archer instead of this. All right, let's do it. We got archers, make it happen. And it could even be a fun experience sure. or a casual experience. Yeah, like, yes. I mean, look, it's it's not about whether you're winning or losing. Because we all want to win. We're not playing. Nobody played magic to lose. Sometimes right. I do because I'm being silly. Well, sometimes then the lose, you have a card in play that means you win. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It's like, turns out Thassa's Oracle's a card, right? <laughs> or, or is it? <laughs> Lab Boy, maniac, is it? Uh, laboratory Maniac, Jace's yep. whatever. But Jace's whatever. I want uh, a card called Jace's whatever. But the th- <laughs> I, you know, you had a card name, but I forgot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the point, though, is the point, though, is it's the mentality that you're looking for. Like, what do you want? The, yeah. Like, I still want to win. I just don't want to win that stopped you from, I, I want to win because we played a game. I right. don't want to win because I played a game and you watched me play. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's a really good, good mentality just in deck construction at the casual level. Uh, uh, or I would also say if you do have a kind of, lockout that that's part of like again in a stack stack where you are you are building towards a win that isn't going to just linger forever i think it's that slow lingering yeah it's like you don't want to be the the death. nickel and diming someone to yeah death. Now, yeah if i can give a defense of stacks for a second because i Please. i hate stacks it's my least favorite way to play magic it is 100% the most miserable way. Be sure to check out my deck tech for Urza stacks uh, located oh, here. Fantastic. Urza <laughs> stacks. There you go. Urza. Oh but, my God. You know, I do, I do that, that deck tech and it's, it's got five times the views of Sir Kara, you know, uh, there you go. But anyway, well, Urza is a, I mean, Urza is a mean old man, but um, the thing though, is that when you're playing in a meta with your friends and, or with your group at your local game store, and sometimes decks get out of control and sometimes yeah. people are just going and you're just steadily building up. The war is getting stronger and stronger because that's just what happens in groups. You always want to one up your, your play group. Sure. Some point you do need to have stacks, which is the $5,000 solution, right? Like the whole point of stacks was to stop vintage decks from getting too big for their britches, right? Right. Like it's to slow people down. It's to tax you. It's to prevent you from doing things, teach you a lesson that maybe this is getting out of control. Magic needs escape valves like that. You need to have oh, yeah. the fun killer deck, the fun police that will sit there and go like, okay, guys, we need to ramp back. Because if you're going to keep playing this overwhelming deck that's going to blast us out of the water, let's, I'm going to play my deck that's going to punish you for doing that. Right. Fine. The problem is when you sit down and take that punishment deck against somebody who's playing a deck where everybody's in a chair. Fair point. Right? Like, yeah. Like it's, it's all, it comes all about the way back to that first Rule zero discussion. What are we playing? What kind of game are we playing? Are we playing a hardcore competitive cutthroat game? Rad, I'll pull out my super combo deck. And you can pull out your stack deck and we can do this. As long as we understand, then our fun can still be at parity to each other. And we can still be keeping it casual while playing the most hardcore, aggressively competitive decks there is. But if there's an imbalance, if there's a discussion break, if there's a lack of communication where it's like, Okay, well, I thought we were just playing, you know, my I was playing my seven and you're playing your seven. My seven is like, you know, all unblockable walls that'll come and crush you with Utica and Arcade's uh, Sabbath. And your seven is just like, you know, playing your generic goblins deck. Right. Whoops. Like we weren't discussing, right? And you're, we, you're veering very close to the restricted line of power level talk here. And it's vital, but we've... Well, yep. it's, just, it's, yep. a, it's just the important thing that matters is the discussion. Right. And yes, the, the, the discussion. The, the, and I think that's that's something that's so overlooked. And I experienced that at, at Command Fest, where a lot of people were very surprised with me uh, before games when I was saying, all right, let's talk a little bit about what, what we're playing and what we don't want to see. And, and I remember one person in particular really gave me a look almost like I was looking for information on his deck and i was like so are you playing this and he was like yeah and and it was like well look i want to know what's i don't there's certain decks i don't want to sit down against right now because i i don't want to be in a five-hour game so i'm sure. checking for that it's like i i, I want to get five more commander games in this afternoon sort of thing and i think that communication really is the key in that regard right yeah. exactly i mean look it's there's there's a line between hey what kind of deck are you playing and hey tell me the deck so i can tech against it mm-hmm. right like that's not the kind of, I mean, I'm not trying to get that win. I right. don't want to win because I built the deck that has the key to win your deck. Yeah. Like we're playing commander. We don't have sideboards for a reason. Right. Right. Like my sideboard is my deck box. 
No, that's not a fun way to play commander. I, I want to play the commander I want to play. I just want to make sure that we're all just in the same neighborhood as each other. Sure, sure. That makes a lot like, of sense. Like sometimes it's, I mean, sometimes it's fine for me to accidentally oops into my low power deck against all your high power decks and just get blanked out of the game. Uh, you know what? It happened. Whatever. I wanted to play this commander. I knew what I was getting into. I got crushed. That's fine. And sometimes it's the, you know, the reverse. You're like, hey, guys, I just built this deck. I don't necessarily know the power level. Oh, my God, I'm sorry. I just blew everybody out of the water. Right, right. That feels bad, too. But it's also like, it happens. It's casual. There's nothing Shuffle on the up, line. Shuffle get another game. Yeah, it's, up, get there's nothing game. on the line except our good time. Right, absolutely. Speaking of cards uh, that may or may not be ones that you want to include in your deck, I want to ask you about the made-for-commander cards that you see in commander pre-cons and... Do you feel that these cards encourage players to be more competitive because these are often optimized cards? These are often pushed cards. Uh, when they come out with a commander that is the brand new vampire commander of Edgar Markov, that is better than any pre-existing vampire commander by leaps and bounds. And it is incredibly powerful. Are, are, isn't that encouraging more competitive play of like, well, better optimize your deck, better take out Anna Win the Rune Sage, who I have a deck tech on, and but no one's going to run. And people used to run Anna Win. And now it's like, why are you running Anna Win when Edgar Markov is around? Why are you running anyone but Edgar Markov? Are, it, it, what, do you, what do you make of that? Or am I off base? Because I know people love those Edgar Markovs. So <laughs> Edgar Markov is a weird and Brea and yeah, yeah because Edgar Markov is one of those cards that's just like so strong and it's fun to play but it's not fun to play against mm. and I think I would question whether it's even fun to play anymore because it's so formula and so kind of repetitive the same way formula and repetitive does it's like we don't want to do that in commander but the pre-con cards kind of push us towards doing that more and more with each new this is better than than the alternative card each pushed card kind of takes a slot, doesn't it? It's my biggest fear that at some point, Commander is going to be 60 cards that were, you know, pre-made specifically for Commander and then 30 flex slots that you can just play around with. And I think that Wizards of the Coast is trying very hard not to let that happen. You do? Okay. Yeah. Well, it's, it's my hope, my optimistic hope that they understand that this is where we're going because we don't want them to just give us a deck. Like, that's not the fun of Commander. Right. I mean, yeah, Commander Precons are great. I love them. But I think that there's a whole, like, block of these cards that are so strong and overwhelming and do such specific to Commander things that there's a danger in, um, I don't want to say competitive, but just strength of your deck just gets way out of control. Yeah. Like, because in terms of competitive Commander, in terms of CEDH, the most impactful commander-only cards were specifically the partner commanders mm -hmm. because that gives you two fixed spells that you always have access to with independent commander tax, so you can still play them super cheaply and you can get crazy busted with them. Like, the the combo that is the most obscene is Thrasios and Timna. So Thrasios is the um, merfolk that costs a like, blue-green. Yes. And he's got a uh, pay four and you can look at the top of your card. If it's a land, you put it into play. Otherwise, you draw the card. And there's so many different ways to go infinite with that thing and just get your whole deck into your hand or into play. And then Timna lets you uh, draw cards and uh, gain life based on the amount of damage you did. And because those four colors are uh, gives you blue, green, white, black. So it gives you those four colors. It gives you access to a huge array of cards. But because those two cards are so strong, anything you put underneath them that deck is just going to be absurdly strong. And I think that, especially at CEDH level with things like Flash Hulk or Demonic Consultation or these other kind of combos that you can run, having access to four colors off of two commanders that are super good is going to, by default, just kind of program your deck to be very linear and very structured, almost like a standard deck or a vintage or modern archetype where mm -hmm. like, you know, like if you pick up a modern deck, it's almost like a formula, like a recipe, like here is just, these are the slots for this deck. Right. And we explicitly don't want Commander to be that way because the joy of Commander is that my Brea deck and Olivia's Brea deck are fundamentally different decks. They work in totally different axes. Mm -hmm. We're trying to aim for completely different goals and results. But you're both running Brea. 
yeah, but that's okay. I mean, yeah. running the same commander, the I worry about the old oh, the the old commanders getting pushed out more and more. And and like I said, I mean, I made the comment about like you know, uh, uh, Anawan, uh, Anawan right. and Sarkara are just not going to be run over Urza and See, and that, and Brea. But I I don't think that's true though. Yeah, and I will contest that because of the fact that for one thing, Urza. Not a lot of people run Urza. People will build the Urza deck and play it once, realize yeah. how powerful it is and how little fun you're having. It's true. Urza is a good card in the 99, but not leading your deck. Right. Because everybody will just immediately target you and you become the arch enemy. And then right. that's not fun. Yeah. Unless you are, unless that's what you want. Happy birthday. Sure. Our arch but, enemy is fun. But, you get to do the voice and everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that there's so many legendary creatures and so right. many ways to express yourself. Yeah. And the tens of thousands of people who play Commander... Or doing like how many different aristocrat sacrifice decks you can do? You can do Corval, sure. you can do Slimefoot, you can do like there's a billion different ways to make. I mean, Sir Conrad, all right. these different decks you can build that are flavored differently. Um, or even Yogmoth, or like I mean, Chainer, you know, there's just Chainer's millions and millions one, yeah. of cool. I think there's so many choices that even though there are some very good float to the top, like cream of the crop choices, like Edgar Markov. I think that the commander fan base, the casual player base, is going to gravitate to the cards that they like. Mm -hmm. Yes, the the top end of the commander deck will be trying to say, like, look, man, Thracio Centimna is just the best commanders. We're going to play them because they win. Okay, fine. That's what you want. Knock yourself out. They're right there. But I'm going to be playing, like, you know, Kalemni, the giant, or some random just, you know, Rafik or... Mm -hmm. I don't know, Lady Orca, whatever, something from sure. like 12 million years ago. Why? Because I can. Yes. That's the that's a it's great commander, reason. man. There's yeah. there's nothing on the table. As long as I'm having a good time, then whatever. Look, Atraxa is one of my least favorite cards in Magic because it makes things too powerful too quickly, proliferating every turn, making your planeswalker super good. I think that card is busted and unfriendly. But I also don't think that that card is stopping anybody from playing like gave or gave or whatever to be able to do your uh, tokens and plus one plus one shenanigans, even though attracts would just be better at that. Right. I don't think that uh, playing attracts is going to stop you from playing Dejeru for being making your kind of like planeswalker deck. Right. I don't know. I think that there's a lot of options available still, and I think people's creativity and the fact that Commander encourages you to play the kind of magic you want to play, even without being the most powerful deck, I think that will keep Commander from becoming just three or four different specific generals you play all the time. Me too, me too. Well, Shivan, thank you so much for coming out here. You have your very own podcast all about not just Commander, but casual magic. Uh, if people want to find it, I'm going to put links in the description, but do you want to take a minute just to tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, sure. So uh, I have started a podcast called Casual Magic, which Shivan put the whole point of my podcast is to explore the fun side of Magic the Gathering that isn't just Commander, isn't just Brawl, isn't just like Popper, but is the whole panoply of the ways we play from pre-constructed decks mm -hmm. to chaos drafting to multiplayer formats of plane chase, all the weirdo fun things we can do in Magic. And because I feel that there's been so much content generated for the higher competitive spikier players and not enough for us who are just sitting there and like, my favorite way to play is all the cards I own in a pile. Yeah. And that is just as legitimate a way to play magic as there is. It's actually more broken than most ways of magic, too. Oh, yeah, too. dude, because there ain't no band list on my kitchen my pile. Table. Yeah, my pile. Yeah. <laughs> it turns out I've got black lotuses, Zzz, plural. Right. <laughs> you do not. I don't even have one. <laughs> <laughs> but I have Nick's lotus. So that's almost the same thing, right? Yeah. Casual magic, though. And you can find it on uh, basically anywhere you get podcasts, iTunes, and Spotify's, and what have you. And at my uh, Twitter feed of Girapuri Gears, which I'm sure you'll put a link in, where I post my new episodes every week and also just talk about Commander all the time. Because, frankly, like I said at the end of my podcast, it's not about magic without the gathering, right? I think that's turning into a new phrase. I've said that yeah. a lot on, on, on here, too. Uh, so I heard it from you first, and I definitely stole it from you. Stole it? Well, you'll be hearing from my lawyers. So, And if you want to uh, <laughs> listen to this podcast or my podcasts, they appear with a delay 
uh, in the links in this video's description. So you can listen to this as well as previous podcasts on your favorite podcast software, but there is a delay. It goes up on YouTube first. Uh, speaking real quick of casual fringe formats, there's one I've been hearing some people are getting into. It's 60 cards, not 100. I don't understand. You can have up to four copies of a card, what? but you can only use cards from the last two years. <laughs> and as soon as a card is more than two years old, there's a day that they pick it, but then basically you can't use that card anymore. So you have to keep remaking the deck. What? And not a lot of people, it's very fringe. I saw, I think six people managed to get together at my local game store uh, after Commander Night to, to, to play it, but Whoa. they're calling it like just a standard game of magic. What a weird idea. It's weird, what? huh? I don't, how, why would you put more than one of a card in your deck though? Like, I don't understand. Like, what do you need two cards for? Well, are you interested in giving it a try? No. Targeting our Archaeomancer with Ghostly Flicker, we can return our Flicker back to our hand after it resolves. Flicker, however, requires us to hit two targets, and that's where this gets extra evil. By choosing Chittering Rats as our second Flicker target, we can repeatedly make our opponent put cards from their hand on top of their deck, both depriving them of cards to play with as well as future draw steps. The reason we call this deck Ratlock is because of this combo. Once your opponent is left with no cards in their hand, we can simply cast Ghostly Flicker on an Archaeomancer and a Chittering Rats during our opponent's draw steps after they've drawn their card for turn, thus ensuring that...